Oh, okay. I got it. Alright, so we'll continue on. Um, so the baby has been born and we've assessed the newborn. We've already gone through the steps where um, you stimulate, get them breathing, assess their heart rate, respiratory rate, and assist if you need to. Um, there's some other ways of monitoring after you're born. And I'll give you the definition of asphyxia neonatorum. This is a condition caused by lack of oxygen. It can occur before the baby is born. It can occur following delivery. And what happens is um, there's um, some lack of oxygen. And it, first it will cause a primary apnea where there will be an, an initial period of rapid breathing because the infant is trying to get some more oxygen to the tissues. But if the asphyxia continues, meaning lack of oxygen, then they stop breathing. Their respiratory movements cease, and then the heart rate begins to fall. So this is different than how adults respond to lack of oxygen in the body. Um, if we become hypoxic, what does that do to our heart rate? It increases. Yeah, it causes it to go high. But with neonates, and even if it's in utero, lack of oxygen can cause them to stop breathing and their heart rate falls. If, they, if you stimulate them and get them to start breathing, if, you, if they get oxygen into the tissues, then they'll continue breathing. So it'll be a short period, you stimulate them, they start breathing and their oxygen level goes up, then they're fine. But if they start breathing, they don't get any oxygen, they're going to have a period of apnea, nobody intervenes. Um, they'll try deep gasping respirations, um, the heart rate will continue to fall, blood pressure will continue to fall, but then respirations will taper off and then there's a secondary apnea and no matter how you stimulate the infant, they won't start breathing again. So at this point, they need to be placed on a ventilator, and their breathing needs to be supported. Now, when this happens, uh, this is causing like mental, like, um, like some mental illness, possibly, like later on? Yeah, so um, we'll talk about um, premature apnea in newborns, where they're born prematurely and the brainstem hasn't developed yet. And they have a lot of periods of apneas. I mean, you keep track of them during the shift. Like, how many apneas and bradycardias did they have today? Um, so that's from being born prematurely, and the brainstem just isn't developed enough yet. Um, so this is when somehow there's a lack of oxygen to the tissue. So it could be a full-term newborn that uh, maybe the umbilical cord was somehow squeezed and they're not getting blood flow. So something's happening that's preventing oxygen from getting to their tissues, and it just causes them to stop breathing. Another thing you assess with is called APGAR score. So let me give you all the information about APGAR score. It's interesting that the name APGAR came from the person who created this. It was a, a female, Dr. Apgar. But the letters in her name help to know what you're assessing. So there's some boxes there for you to fill in. For the first sign when you're assessing the newborn is A for appearance. You have to kind of start over on the left side of the page to make it all fit. Um, so the first one is appearance, and this has to do with the color. So in the box, you would give them a score of zero if they're cyanotic or blue. So completely blue, you're going to give them a score of zero. So in that box, you can write down cyanotic for under zero? Mm -hmm. Yes. I have blue. I don't know why I didn't put cyanosis. <laughs> um, number, you give them a score of one if their um, lips are pink and the head is pink but the extremities are blue. Okay. Upper pink. So pink with blue extremities is how I feel. Oh, okay. really? 
And then for a score of two, then they have a pink, um, pink lips, head, body, extremities, they're all pink. Pink everything. Pink everything. They get a score of two. Um, the next box is P, pulse. If the heart, if they don't have a heart rate and the heart's not beating, they get a score of zero. If they have a score, you give them a score of one, if the heart rate is less than 100. And a score of two, if the heart rate is greater than 100. So a score of zero, if there's no heart rate, a score of one for less than 100 per minute, and a score of two for greater than 100 per minute. The third one is G for grimace. Yes. Um, and then write yourself a little bit of note. When a catheter is inserted into the nose or into the nares, and there's no response, that get, that's what you put down for zero score. Just put none. So a catheter in the nares, there's no response. That's a score of zero. If there is a grimace, you give them a score of one. So in the box under one, you give them a, um, you write down grimace, they would get a score of one if they grimace when the catheter is inserted. And for the box under two, if they cry, cough, or sneeze, you give them a score of two. So if they cry, cough, or sneeze, they get a score of two. The next A is for activity. And that's referring to their muscle tone. So in the box for zero, write down limp. So if they're completely flaccid or limp, they get a score of zero. If there's some flexion of the muscles, they get a score of one. So in that box, write some flexion. And for a score of two, they're well flexed, meaning that the arms are flexed, the legs are flexed. That's a score of two, well flexed. And then R stands for respiration. They would get a score of zero if there's no breathing. So you could just write respirations, none. Uh, weak respirations or irregular gets a score of one. So weak or irregular is a score of one. And a two if their respirations are strong. All right, so here's some scenarios. On the left, we have an infant born with a heart rate of 160 per minute, respirations are strong. Muscle tone, there's some flexion of the extremities. The reflexes, uh, the baby coughs when the suction catheter is inserted. The body is pink and the extremities are blue. That was fast. All right, so heart rate 160, got a score of two. Respiration strong. Two. two. Muscle tone, some flexion. One. That's one. Coughs with a suction catheter. Two. 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 Seven. And then the body is pink and the extremities one. blue. One. one. Okay. Score of eight. So when the score is between seven and ten, you observe. 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 Seven to ten, APGAR score, seven to ten. 
observe the infant? All right, what is about the next column? Um, infant born heart rate is less than 100 per minute. Respirations are weak. Muscle tone is limp. Um, with reflexes, the infant grimaces when a suction catheter is inserted into the nose. And there's cyanosis throughout. Got three. Yeah. You got a three? Yeah, three. All right, so a score of zero to three. You ventilate with PPV, positive pressure ventilation. And begin compressions if heart rate is less than 60. So zero to three, you ventilate. Begin compressions if heart rate less than 60. All right, so we talked about seven to 10, we talked about zero to three. There's one more category that I don't have a scenario for. And that's if the score is the FR score four to six. Give O2 and gentle stimulation. FR score between four and six. Give O2 and gentle stimulation. How would you gently stimulate the baby? Um, by drying them with towels. Oh. <clears throat> All right, and then the other notes is after our score is done after one minute and after five minutes. All right, so the first four minutes that we went through on um, what to do first, what to do second, when to do it, is pretty much what you see in the delivery rooms. Um, APGAR score, if they officially do it and you find it in the notes, let me know. Um, but it's not like you wait for a minute, you get an APGAR score, and you say, oh, the APGAR score is three. I think we need to start positive pressure ventilation. So you don't do APGAR number. You just do, oh, wait a minute, they're not breathing. Let me start breathing for them. Heart rate's low, let me start compressions. But testing purposes, you're going to be given APGAR scores, and you're going to be asked what you should do with a certain APGAR score. Oh, with the specific? Yeah. Begin compressions if the heart rate is less than 60. Got that? All right, so for vital signs, a normal heart rate for a neonate is between 100, 180 per minute. Um, as the infant grows, the heart rate is less, so uh, it gives you a, a lower range compared to um, when they're first born. So 100 to 180 when they're first born, by the time they're six months, 160. The heart rate doesn't really stay the same all the time. And you notice that it fluctuates a lot. It goes up and down. And you don't get a constant heart rate. Same thing with the breathing pattern. It's up and down. It doesn't stay constant. <clears throat> Crying, fever, and stress is going to increase the heart rate. And the bradycardia that you see, it's typically from hypoxia or stimulation of the vagus nerve. Now, to simulate the vagal nerve, how could we possibly do that? <clears throat> if they're not intubated or anything? 
Control. Yeah, we're putting a suction catheter Control. into the trachea. <coughs> All right, for normal blood pressure with a 1500 gram neonate, that would be a premature neonate born at what, like 28 weeks? That would be a normal blood pressure around 28 weeks of gestation. Greater than 3000 grams would be what, six and a half pounds? A normal blood pressure is about 60 over 40. So I already showed you a way to calculate blood pressure. You take the, the systolic plus two times diastolic divided by three, and if it comes out to be around the gestational age, then that's a normal blood pressure for that infant. Um, so it gives you a sample. It says 37 week neonate weighs 2,500 grams. What would you expect the blood pressure to be? So let's start off with the middle. Let's start off with C, because that is the correct response. Um, 50 plus 2 times 30 would be 60. So 50 and 60, 110. Divide by 3, what do you get? 36.6? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's a normal blood pressure for 37 weeks. <coughs> B would be normal for 40 weeks gestation. But rather than memorizing all the numbers, um, if you remember normal is 50 over 30 for a near term, and just think a little less than that when they're premature, a little bit more than that when they're 40 weeks, and that way you have less numbers to memorize. Normal respiratory rate for neonates is between 30 and 60 breaths per minute. By the time they're one year old, normal respiratory rate is 24 to 40 per minute. And now for ABGs, when the baby's first born, after four minutes, if you drew a blood gas, um, you would see a respiratory acidosis because after going through the birthing process, there's a little bit of time before gas exchange kind of settles in. And the normal after four minutes is a 7.20 pH. Mm -hmm. um, CO2 of 46. And PaO2 of 53. And then after one hour, the blood gases are normal, 7.36. The PCO2 is 34. And the PAO2 is 70. A newborn has anatomical differences compared to an adult. Um, the first thing it mentions is that they're obligate nose breathers. So because the tongue is really large in their mouth, they can't really exchange that much air through their mouth unless they're crying. When they cry, the mouth opens up wide enough and the tongue comes down, and when they're crying, they can exchange air through their mouth. But everything else is going to be through the nose. And so that causes a dilemma if their nose gets stuffed or clogged, and they're trying to breathe through their nose and they can't, they're going to be crying a lot. Because um, they'll become, um, they'll have difficulty breathing, and then they'll start crying because of it, and that opens up their mouth. And then they settle down, they try to breathe through their nose, and they can, and then they start crying. So they're real irritable. Um, the second one, the larynx is funnel-shaped, meaning that the narrowest passage is through the cricoid cartilage rather than through the glottis. I need a picture. Oh, kind of shows that's it. A, that's a big difference. Yeah. Um, so with an adult, the narrow part is through the vocal cords. That's the narrowest part. But with an infant, the narrowest part is the size of the cricoid cartilage. 
And that becomes important information to understand why when we intubate with an endotracheal tube with neonates, there's no cuff on the end of it. But with adults, or even with kids, like four years old and up, there's a cuff on the end of the ear under tube. Um, and then the reason is that that small cartilage comes close enough to the size of the endotube and it forms pretty much a seal around the endotube. So there's really no need for a cuff. Um, so typically you'll start off with a cuffless endotube and only if you can't ventilate because there's too much air leaking around the tube do you switch over to a cuffed endotube. But you start off with a cuffless endotube. Is there more? So the larynx is funnel shaped. The number of alveoli are far less than adults. Did I give you the number of alveoli when the baby's yeah. born? Yeah, I don't remember. No? 50 million. 50 million. Oh, yeah. And how many are in the adults? 300 million. 300 million. Very good. So the alveoli keep growing. Until what age? Eight, eight. eight years of age. Very good. All right, and then there's some physiologic differences too. Um, the first one that we already discussed, um, the response to severe hypoxemia when their PaO2 drops below 30 to 40 torr is they stop breathing. So that's one difference compared to adults. Uh, the next one for temperature regulation, the size of a neonate's body surface area compared to their total size is much greater than it is with adults. So body surface area for a neonate versus body surface area for an adult. Um, there's a lot more body surface area for a neonate and that causes them to lose a lot of body heat. If their temperature drops, they utilize more oxygen to try to stay warm, so it can cause them to utilize a lot more oxygen. Um, they have a minimal ability to shiver. So when we get cold, you know, our arms start shaking, and that's muscles shake to produce heat. Um, neonates don't have that ability to shiver and produce extra heat. So their body temperature starts to drop. Um, there is some fat tissue on the back of the neck that's brown in color. Um, so it's called, I don't have a name, just brown adipose tissue. And the metabolism of that brown fat provides a way of increasing heat. So um, premature infants haven't produced that fat in the back of their neck. Um, and they can't produce extra heat. So they're even more susceptible to hypothermia. Um, so it's really important to provide a neutral thermal environment. When it says neutral, do you know what that means? Yeah, not too hot, not too cold. It's got to be, keep their body temperature normal. You want to keep the skin temperature at 36 degrees Celsius. Less than 36 degrees causes cold stress. You said causes cold stress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if their bodies get too cold, it stresses them. Um, and then there's um, another note I want you to write down. It's called hands off time. Hands off time. In the neonatal ICU, when you assign to patients in the ICU, you can't do your ventilator check whenever you finish. Like if you're doing something and you're really busy and then you go over, um, do a ventilator check and listen to breath sounds and suction the baby and um, when the babies are um, stimulated too much then they stop growing 
they don't have the same weight gain as an infant that's left untouched for several hours at a time. So that's what they call hands-off time. Like you and nursing get together and decide the time that you can go in and touch the baby. So you get everything done at one time, and then it's hands-off time. Also in the neonatal ICU, you'll notice that you want to keep quiet around them so they can have rest, and the lights are usually kept lower because lights can produce um, too much stimuli and that causes stress. All right, so hands-off time. In the NICU, do you, have, you know what to write down for that? Hands off time due to the Okay, so hands off time, um, you, you get with nursing for stimulating the baby. Some grow and gain weight. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, how many studies have been done with babies that were not touched and stimulated at all? And how how their minds don't develop normally because of lack of love and touch and holding. You want the skin temperature to be 36 degrees? Yes. Yes, this is an incubator. Um, the incubator keeps the air around the infant warm, and there's also a reservoir of water that heats up and puts molecules of moisture into the air, so they get heat and moisture. Do you know what these circles are for? To put your hands in? Yes. Yes. I don't know the age limit. Good question. Yeah, once they're full term, maybe they're moved. I don't know what the age limit is. That is. Significant? Are you thinking once they get to be too big, they can't fit in there anymore? <laughs> like if you have a full term infant yeah. in the NICU, will they fit inside the incubator? Is that what you're wondering? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm curious, like, if they're in there because they haven't fully developed age yet, or they you may have like some kind of yeah, depending on the different disease, are they placed in something different other than an incubator? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure if it's enough to just swaddle them in a blanket and put them in a bassinet, then they would do that also. All right, so some definitions for skin color. Um, when there's blue extremities but a pink head and torso, that's called acrocyanosis. It usually just means that they're either cold or um, there's low blood flow. So the body will keep blood flow to the head to, per to keep the brain protected from lack of blood flow. So the head will stay pink. Um, the major organs will still get blood flow, but blood flow will be constricted going to the legs and the hands. So you'll see blue fingers, blue toes, but they'll still have a good oxygen saturation when you check the O2 set. Um, and then the next definition is jaundice, and this is a yellow skin color caused by high bilirubin in the blood. The eyes will look yellow, uh, like the, the white part of the eyes will be yellow. The skin will look yellow. And this is due to 
um, breakdown of red blood cells. with an immature liver. So breakdown of red blood cells. I guess you could write um, doesn't occur normally due to immature liver. My niece was born with jaundice. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And she was born with, she was really yellow, and the doctor immediately called it jaundice. Yeah. As soon as she was born. Yeah. So it's a breakdown of red blood cells. Um, due to an immature liver. Or it doesn't happen due to an immature liver. I'm sorry. So if the liver can't break down the red blood cells, then conjugated bilirubin is produced. So if the liver cannot break down red blood cells correctly, um, there's conjugated bilirubin that builds up in the blood. Conjugated is spelled C-O-N-J-U-G-A-T-E-D, conjugated. Conjugated bilirubin is produced. Greater than 25 milligrams per deciliter can <coughs> cause brain damage. Greater than 25 milligrams per deciliter can cause brain damage. And normal, a normal bilirubin level is less than 12 milligrams per deciliter. Really yeah, like more than double mm -hmm. can brain damage. All right, everybody got those numbers? <coughs> okay, so normal is less than 12 milligrams per deciliter. And brain damage, 25 milligrams per deciliter. So the treatment for hyperbilirubinemia, <laughs> say that fast sometimes, <laughs> is phototherapy. So they just put lights on them? Yes. Yeah, they did too. So a fluorescent light will shine through the skin and actually convert the conjugated bilirubin to unconjugated bilirubin and make it safe. Yeah, just by being under fluorescent light or taking the baby out into the sunshine. Oh, that's even better. So the sun does it or fluorescent light. And the fluorescent lights or the um, billy lights that they use in the NICU can hurt the eyes. So you'll see them put like a mask over their eyes to protect their eyes from the light. 